Hello everyone, I am JP and this is the latest entry in my video series in which I talk about the game that I am developing. And yeah, let's jump in. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I have some on-screen progress to show here um, and some notes to go over. Something that uh, I realized would help me keep track of this. When I was working in AAA game development, like on the Bioshock games and stuff, uh, at 2K Marin we would write up, everybody on the team would write up their uh, their achievements and objectives, which was what they did the previous week and then what they hoped to do over the, over the next week. Um, and I realized that that might be a useful way to keep track of what I'm of what I'm doing for the purposes of these videos. I have a I have a much I have a fairly detailed to do and task list and priority list and all that, but I'm not going to I'm not going to show you that exactly. Anyway, um, so yeah, when I left off last video, <clears throat> I remember telling you that I was thinking about some high level creative stuff. I felt like there was still there was still a, an idea, a, one or more ideas that were needed to kind of like bring things together and just sort of help me make other smaller creative decisions and stuff like that. Uh, and I did a bunch of thinking about that and I came up with some answers that I'm pretty happy with and I don't want to share all of those with you exactly just because I want to tease things out gradually and maybe have something left in the tank for when I announce this game. But uh, one of the things that I did come up with was... Um, the number four as a visual motif. Now, uh, already in the design and in the story for the game, I had this idea of the number of there being four of something and four of another thing. Um, could I put it any more vague than that? Pro probably not. Anyway, there are four characters, and they're all and they're connected, and they come from four different places. And uh, I realized, like, oh well, gee, I can I can actually. I can use this these clusterings of four things, like just any place where you could have a visual element that's repeated or something. You know, you can have uh, you can have you can use four of something. Like, uh, let me jump over to art mode here. Yeah, like when I was making, I was like, I want to make like a test decoration for this new area that I'm doing some art stuff for. And I was like, well, I want to have a candelabra because that's that's appropriate to this kind of area. And I was like, well, of course there will be four there will be four candles coming off of it and that that makes sense so that's something that i've been able to weave throughout um i don't think there's any particular like numerology to it there's not going to be like this grand symbolic meaning behind the number four because actually i think that kind of stuff becomes a little brittle uh because if everything has to be fours then it's like oh well i can only do i have i have five of the of this cool thing but i guess i have to cut one or i only have three of this i gotta guess i gotta guess i gotta make up one that kind of that kind of isn't as good <laughs> Um, anyway, so yeah, and this is the, uh, yeah, this is a new area. This is a new, like, environment style for the game, and this is a rough version of a new character. Uh, she is one of these characters that I mentioned, and like I said, they're related. Um, and yeah, this is the environment that she is native to, and... Yeah, so like, I just wanted to um, let me bring up my little edit UI here. You know, I wanted to, uh, I did a few art tests for like, what would this look like? You know, I was like, okay, well, I want to have this area and it's more like kind of an ancient temple. It's not alluding to any specific world culture. It's just kind of this visually interesting to me amalgamation of things that hopefully is, isn't disrespectful to anybody, but also, you know, but and is also just kind of original and interesting. So, yeah, that's what I've been playing with here. I came up with, like, these different, um, you know, pillar. I was like, let me make a pillar because that's literally what, what's holding up the rest of the structure. And maybe that'll be a good conceptual starting point. And so I made a few of these wall panel type things. These all ended up being kind of decorative, and I just love these faces. This was from a piece of art that I did uh, for the game, like, right at the beginning last year. Um, and, yeah, so these are kind of more just, like, decorative things. I, I probably also need just some normal this is just a plain old wall and there's nothing much on it but yeah and then this floor tile i'm not as quite as happy with but um you know it's a starting point and it gives me like you know some walls and some pillars and some floors and then i was like yeah and i want there to be a water feature in here too because this might play into some gameplay stuff that i'm doing so i have like this is my first pass at 
kind of some effects animation. Um, this is like, there's things about all of this actually that I'm not exactly happy with, but um, like this, this waterfall, for instance, like it looks cool, but it's way too, like it's defined by solid colors. And one of the things I realized as I was doing this was like early on, was like, I want, um, I think there's a lot of visual personality and just uniqueness kind of um, to be gained from things coming up out of a black background. Like often it's lines on a, against, a black, uh, against a black background or a dark background. Because um, for one, that like sort of lets the CRT shader that I've got here, it lets things bleed out into that black background. And there's also kind of like a, a cognitive effect that I think is interesting about the black background. And I think I, I talked to, I alluded to this kind of like, y'all remember late last year, um, I was working on that Ultima 4 map viewer. And before that, I worked like years before I worked on, I, I wrote a, a blog post on my old blog that I don't update anymore called Imaginative Play, where I'm talking about how like, yeah, games used to, they used to have to engage the player's imagination in order to, uh, in order to, 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 to make anything exciting happen in the player's mind at all. And then we got the ability to have like really fancy graphics and we kind of dropped that. Um, and I think there's something that's always specifically stuck in my mind. Like the reason that I felt like Ultima's world was kind of magical was because, um, was because it was like, you know, line art against a black background. Um, and you could, that, that's not to say that you can't have areas of solid color, but, um, but yeah, so I was kind of going with that, and that, that is what I've been doing for the, the art in, in the other areas as well. Um, and then the characters themselves are more these solid colors, both because it makes them stand out a lot, you know, uh, and also just, you know, I, th there's, a, there's a, yeah, it's, it's, it should probably be obvious why that's a good thing here. Anyway, um, and I made this water a solid color, which I don't know if I really want to do that. Um, I think this was just the first thing that came to mind. Um, but I think I'll probably be going back to the well on that. Um, so anyway, yeah, what else? Um, yeah, this is that's, start, that's sort of starting to get into what I hope to achieve in the next week or two. Um, over and above that, I actually did uh, I did several bits of work on Playski, um, and I've put out a few different new releases. Like it's now up to 0 0.6, 0 0.6.4, and as always, you can get the latest version of it on itch.io. Whoa! Oh, cool! Itch.io's little widget on the page here. Um, Anyway, yeah, you can get the latest version of Playski. It's open source, you know, you can look at uh, all the code commits that have gone into Playski, all the stuff that I've done over the past. Uh, this doesn't cover the, the, the feature stuff that I've done in my private repository where I'm developing the game, but if you're curious about, I don't consider it necessarily worth it to do like detailed change lists for Playski. Like if I knew thousands of people were using Playski to make art and games, then maybe I would have more of a motivation to do detailed change lists. But if you really care about what's new in the latest versions of Playski, then you can go to my Bitbucket page and look at the commit list. Um, yeah, so yeah, one of the things that I added uh, to Playski was um, in art mode, like, yeah, I was working on this version of it. I was like, okay, let me just make like a doodle pad here where I can explore a bunch of different ideas for this pillar thing. All right, cool, now I'm doing these wall panels. And I had a more uh, developed version of this, which you can see here, where I had done like a floor thing and I had kind of worked with this a little more. And I saved that, but I didn't check it in because I was like, oh, I'll do another commit. And then I accidentally like, I was doing something. Yeah, I was like, oh, let me crop this artwork so I can save it off under a different file name and stuff. And then I accidentally cropped it and saved it in the original file name. And because you can't redo, I, I never coded the ability to redo uh, crop and resize operations. I actually lost this work. I only I only have it here as a as a as an exported image. Uh, and then I was like, okay, you know what? I have now officially lost. This isn't this work isn't irreplaceable. But now that I've lost work, let me actually do the work to make it so that you can undo resize and crop operations. So I did that. Um, you know, at the point that it has drawn blood from that a feature that a lack of a feature or fix has drawn blood from me, that's when I do something about it. And I've also done a ton of other little things. Uh, I don't know how much of it's really worth getting into. Like for instance, um, if you now if you export, but previously if you exported an image from the editor, like if you did like export PNG, then you would only get a version of the image without, well, you can't see it here because it's doing like some bilinear filtering on this. Anyway, you, you would get like a one-to-one -one pixel perfect version of what you were doing here 
comparable to if you didn't have the CRT shader on, but it's like sometimes I do a piece of artwork and I do want the CRT shader to be on. So that's cool. So let me do that. Um, and so I just made it so that the frame buffer, like when it's rendering to the thing that's going to be written to the image file, it actually uses that and you get like a nice upscaled CRT filtered version of it. This would be for like, you know, when I post stuff on the place key Tumblr, when I post artwork that I've done, you know, it's good for that kind of stuff. Um, that's not a super exciting feature in and of itself, but um, yeah, I added a view menu because it was now material to the program's functionality, whether the CRT filter was on or off, I added a little view menu where you can turn, you know, different features of the camera view off and on. You know, so that's a thing. Uh, but yeah, and there's a whole bunch of little fixes. There was a nasty, there was another nasty undo bug lurking, where if you copied and pasted, then it wouldn't undo properly, and now it does. So that's awesome. I was a little embarrassed that that lasted as long as it did. But yeah, um, and let's see what else. Oh yeah, and I also completely rewrote the uh, the whole file handling thing so that basically whenever you say, um, you know, when you open up when you open up a file, like it goes into different directories to find that file, and the code for that was like a whole bunch of different things in a bunch of different places. Like when I load it in, when you load in a different character set when it tries to load in that file, when it tries to find that file and then load it in and all that, it was going through a, through a fairly different code path. And I was like, well, that's obviously terrible. So I unified all of that. And so that's really good. That also made it very easy for me to, this is probably the least interesting change I may ever show you uh, on these videos, but now it uses OS appropriate documents directories. What's cool about though, is that it mean what's cool about that though, is that it means that, um, is that it means that like now the only things if you download PlaySkey it doesn't write to the application directory. So if you inst if you're on Windows and you install PlaySkey into program files, if you just copy it in there, there's not really an installer yet. Or if you uh, use if you build a Mac application bundle, which we now have a Python script to to do, uh, thanks to uh, thanks to a contributor, um, then you know it won't be writing to files inside the application bundle because that's kind of bad. Um, anyway, and you know, like if you keep all of your stuff in documents or something, um, then yeah, uh, yeah. So now all of my stuff that I'm developing for the game can be in this folder that's completely separate from what I have checked into Bitbucket, into Mercurial. Anyway, that's enough with the stuff that I've done. Um, yeah, like, so I mentioned that I was unhappy with this water stuff, and I kind of did this waterfall here um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in kind of a painful way. Um, like I animated it frame by frame doing like these offsets, which really just kind of involved a bunch of copy pasting, you know, so that this thing could pan. Um, and I really, I knew that that was kind of bad, but I just wanted to get something on screen. And what I think I need is, um, way back, uh, I need a more robust and powerful way to run little bits of Python code on live artwork. Um, so for instance, like instead of animating this, I could actually just set it to be panning, you know, and just have a little bit of Python code that says like, okay, take rows from this, take like, you know, this, this row here, and then just bump it down some and do that for everything so that the texture appears to vertically pan or something. And there's a bunch of other stuff that you can do with that. Like I think, um, I haven't run this in a while. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah. All right. I have a supply rate. Anyway, I've gone off the rails here, but I'm just showing like. Whoops. What? Hmm. Well, anyway, uh, way back in an, in a very early PlaySkey dev update, um, I showed off this ability to run these little things called art scripts on. Um, on uh, on artwork and they really just execute from the art's namespace um, and that's cool and so it's like a way to just mutate a piece of art in real time and I think that's cool but there's probably a more like robust version of that and what that would allow me to do is have things like 
when this wa when I want this water to move around, there can be a little script that's going around like changing that stuff. Not mathematically necessarily, but it's just kind of like mutating it in ways that are sort of varied and interesting. It would also theoretically let me uh, have like when this character walks into the water, um, it actually like causes the original art to ripple. I might just do that by creating a like something like the blob shadow where I create a little um, where I create a little water ripple effect around around where the character's walking. That would certainly be an easy way to do that. But um, but I'm pretty sure for effects, I'm I'm going to need that kind of thing. Um, let me go back to this. Um, yeah, and just also just like I don't really have any uh, like I've got aside from a few little bits like this where I just kind of freehanded it whatever um, for this little torch thing. Um, I've got uh, I kind of want to like do another pass on how visual effects like fire and smoke and stuff like that. Um, it's not going to be like some amazing like GPU accelerated particle wizardry stuff, but I do want things to be able to kind of like move around in a nice, lively, dynamic way that doesn't mean I have to like author each and every little tile because that's that's going to be probably labor intensive and not as interesting looking as something that's a little, a little more semi-procedural. So yeah, um, so yeah, that's, that's a visual R&D task as well as maybe some future work to back that up. Um, so yeah, I also convinced myself, I have convinced myself that, you know, every time... I have, I want to open up a file, I have to like type its name because I don't, I do not have what you would expect in a normal, because I rolled my own GUI stuff here, I do not have what you would expect of a like dedicated file picker where you can navigate direct, where you can click on different directories and all that kind of stuff. And I think at this point, like I had kind of written that feature off as, ah, that would be nice for other users, but I'm fine, I'm a power user. But actually the amount of time that I lose to you know, ha like just, you know, picking stuff. And also like a file picker would have a bunch of other benefits. Like if I'm in game mode here and I'm like, oh yeah, I want to change this, this art here. Um, if that would bring up, you know, it's like, oh, we'll enter the name of the new art. Well, instead of having to type something, what if I could just, what if it would just bring up a file picker dialog and then I could choose it and see a visual preview, you know? And I've already kind of got that. That's the reason that this isn't seeming like a giant mountain of work and it would be, and it, that it would be good bang for buck is that I already have uh, for, for character sets and pa and color palettes. I've already got um, this thing that like shows an image preview and some info and lets you browse different things. And then you can navigate and pick it. Uh, a file picker would work a little differently, but that whole idea of having an, an image preview for every little piece of art that you've done. Um, and then a big, a nice long list. And then the ability to navigate directories up and down and, and then have a feel, uh, probably also a text field up top where you can just type out a full path. So that if you do want to still use the old way, if it is just a few keystrokes to do it, you can do that. So yeah, I think that's going to be worth it. It'll, it'll. I'm sure anybody out there who's using PlaySkey for their own stuff will will appreciate that as well because it's just a good civilized kind of feature to have. Um, yeah. So and then aside from that, like yeah, I think once like I've spent a decent amount of time on like thinking about creative stuff and art stuff. Um, but I'm eager, I'm pretty itchy now to add new features to the game. So uh, to add specifically just like some new objects and behaviors, because that's really where a lot of the interest of this game is going to come from. Things that you can pick up and set down and throw and they combine with things and have different effects and maybe some new uh, uh, NPC or enemy types, you know, like other characters that are walking around in the environment that you have to contend with. So yeah, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do next. So that's where I'm going with it. Um, and yeah, I think that's about all I've got. I've probably rambled on long enough here. But yeah, thank you as always for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, then please let me know in the, in the I guess, the YouTube comments. And thank you as always for watching this. Um, thank you as always to supporters on Patreon. Um, who are whose funding helps me able to keep doing this um, and yeah I think that's about all I've got again yeah if you want to find out more about PlaySkey the open source tool that's behind this game that I'm making then you can go to vectorpoem.com slash PlaySkey you can look at the code at Bitbucket and yeah I think that's about all I've got for today so thank you and have a good day